Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Narayana Kochalakota. Narayana is a professor of economics at the University of Rochester. He has published widely in economics, including in the areas of money and the payment system, business cycles, financial economics, public finance, and dynamic games and contracts. Narayana's current research is on monetary policy. Formerly, Narayana was the president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank, where he served between 2009 and 2015. Part of his responsibilities as president was to serve on the Federal Open Market Committee, or the FOMC, the monetary policy-making arm of the Federal Reserve System. Today, he joins us to talk about his time at the Fed and his current views on Fed policy. Nariano, welcome to the show. David, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Oh, it's a real treat to have you on board. I want to begin by asking, how did you get into macroeconomics? Well, that's a a great question. Um, You know, I I, uh, was, uh, uh, I liked macro really uh, from the very first course I I took in it, which was... uh, with Alan Blinder when I was an undergraduate at Princeton. Um, and uh, when I, I, I majored in math at Princeton, but I really uh, quickly realized that I was missing that connection to the real world, to uh, real world problems that economics provides. And uh, uh, so when I, I, when I applied to graduate school, it was in economics and not in, not in, uh, not in, uh, uh, in math. And, and it, I always thought of myself as being interested in macro and being interested in macro questions. And uh, um, right from the, as I say, right from my freshman year of college and then on into my first year of graduate school, I, I found macro fascinating. So we can thank Alan Blinder for your success as a macro economist, at least getting you going. Uh, Alan was a was an inspirational instructor, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I want to move on to the area that many of our listeners will be eager to hear, and that is your experience as a regional Fed president at the Minneapolis Fed. And I'm going to just work through some basic questions with you. I want to begin by asking, you know, what was it like to be one? What did you do first thing in the morning? Did you get up? Did you read the newspaper, um, go online? Did you get briefings from your staff? No, at most... Uh uh, days, I, I was I was checking. I would guess uh, um, market signals. <laughs> so I'd mm-hmm. be looking at uh, what was going on in in. I, I tend to focus more on on bond markets than maybe on equity okay. markets. So I'd be looking at what was going on in bond markets, maybe foreign exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, depending on you know some of this time frame period uh, was. I was president from 2009 to 2015. Um, so the real. Uh, uh, market instability had had calmed down to a considerable extent, but we had periods where there was a lot going on, just to put it mildly. And yeah, keeping up with markets, I, I view that as being pretty important. Uh, I'd read the the, uh, the major newspapers, the Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times. Um, and then there, uh, increasingly, as I moved along in my job, I appreciated, I would say, uh, reading, there are a number of blogs that I read, um, you know, fairly, fairly, fairly regularly. And, um, I, I thought those were, were, were quite useful in terms of, you know, keeping up with what was keeping up with how others were viewing the fed. You know, I think that one of the mm-hmm. challenges when you're inside the organization is we're all talking to, to each other and it's hard to have the appreciation of, you know, of, of how outsiders view us and the blogs I, I found to be pretty, pretty helpful along that dimension. Um, Financial market participants are also useful to, you know, I, 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 but are you also useful? But I ended up not really following um, those publications, uh, well, I would say at all. <laughs> I, 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 okay. I, I, I relied more on what I was reading in the, in the, in the media and in, 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 uh, in blogs. So was there ever moments when you're reading a blog, you want to pull your hair out and say, no, 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 you got it wrong? But you couldn't because you're the Fed president. <laughs> um, yeah, of course that that happens. Um, uh-huh. You know, I I think it's more that boy, you're reading some people who are uh, trying to follow Fed extremely closely, mm-hmm. and you, you, 
it's more coming out of our own communication that, boy, we're not communicating effectively. Here's this <laughs> okay. uh, individual who doesn't understand what we're trying to do, and mm-hmm. uh, they're very smart, and they're, they're trying to, they, they are trying to understand what we're trying to do. So I, I, I find it useful as a way to, to think on my own communication as an individual member of the hmm. committee, but then also how is, it, how is the committee doing as, uh, in terms of overall communication. I remember probably during that time, maybe 2010, 2011, um, Tim Dewey from the University of Oregon, and still does, writes on the Fed. He's a Fed watcher. And James Bullard, the president of the St. Louis Fed, he wrote a piece where he actually responded to what Tim had said as president. So I found that very uh, fascinating that someone like him was following. And and you just kind of confirmed that. You, too, were looking at what people were saying and, and commenting on the Fed. Yeah, I think the key uh, to that is, you know, you don't want to get into back and forth about uh, sure. picking you in details of, of uh, economic theory. But, but I do think uh, it's, it's uh, someone like Tim in particular, you know, he's obviously a very thoughtful uh, uh, tracker of what's going on in the Fed. Um, mm-hmm. And he doesn't seem to have an obvious advocacy role. So then, you know, then that, that's a person you really – you're hoping really does understand what I, I as a member of the committee is trying to communicate and also what the, the, the overall committee is trying to communicate. So yeah, he's a good example of someone that if he's not understanding what the committee committee is saying, then, then the committee has got a real problem. That, that's interesting. Using people like Tim as, as a, a measure of, of how well you are communicating. So that's, yeah. that's neat to think about that. Let's talk about your job as president. Your, your title is president and CEO, so I'm wondering how much time did you spend on administrative issues versus you know, thinking and preparing um, over monetary policy? So I, I saw the job um, as it unfolded as having three different components. So one okay. was uh, uh, the monetary policy side. Um, the second, which was closely related to that, although uh, distinct in some ways, was, was external communication. Um, which is really a two-way communication. So talking to um, people around my the ninth district of the Federal Reserve in particular about uh, what was going on in their economies, uh, and and then you taking that information forward to the to the FOMC, um, and then also communicating to them uh, again in the ninth district about uh, how is the Fed approaching policy and how I in particular am, am, am thinking about policy. Um, so I, the, the ninth district was huge. So that external communication act, actually ended up taking up a lot of time, and and you have to be very careful what you say in those in those mm-hmm. in, the, in that kind of job. So planning and thinking about how you're going to say what you're going to say uh, that takes a couple a, a lot of time. Um, yeah. So the ninth district, uh, just for your listeners' sake, includes the states of Montana, North and South Dakota, Minnesota, and. Um, uh, parts of Wisconsin and, and Michigan. To just give you a feel how big that is, when I flew from um, Minneapolis to Helena, which is our branch, uh, uh, we had a branch office of our um, of the Fed was located in Helena, Montana. So I actually made that trip quite often. Um, I was. It took me as long as flying to, to Washington D.C. from Minneapolis. Wow. So it's a big, big district. Not that many mm. people live there. So fewer, fewer than nine million people. Mm-hmm. So then the third component is, is, is you're suggesting management. You know, you're a, um, you are the, the CEO of an organization of 1,000 people or more, actually. And then you're uh, really, uh, the tougher part of the job even than that is you're trying to provide a collective leadership uh, to, uh, all the, uh, the, to all 12 banks at once. And the reason I say that is that when the system was first set up, back in uh, 1913, each of the banks were really separate corporate entities, and they're, they're still structured that way legally. But by now, in 2016, um, a lot of what the banks do is really collective. So uh, something like information technology, for example, uh, really is uh, a shared responsibility um, of all the banks. And that entails um, a lot of collective management. Um, and you end up spending a lot of time on those, I found, on, on those mm-hmm. kinds of activities. So I think all told, if you thought about um, policy as being between 25 to 30 percent, uh, external communication being around 
uh, 30%, and then the remainder being management. I think uh, um, certainly by the end of my term, that would be a, a good description of uh, how I was spending my time. Okay. Now, when it comes to speeches, all the uh, presidents give speeches. I'm wondering what motivates one to do a speech. Do you see an issue you want to speak to, or do you have an expectation that you'll do a certain number of speeches each year? How did you come about doing your speeches? Uh, so by and large, um, you know, uh, you don't speak unless you're invited. I mean, it's, it's a, okay. and this is something that is not well understood. I think even by relatively sophisticated fed watchers, because they actually think, <laughs> and I understand the confusion because they think the fed is a planfully, uh, is planful about its communication. That actually is not true. Um, at least that was not <laughs> my experience. Um, okay. my experience was you could be invited, you'd be invited to give talks. Um, mm-hmm. and a lot of them, I was, ex- anything that came within the district, I would be taking very seriously immediately. Um, so anything in that, those, those the, that six state re- uh, region that got uh, immediately got in my, my case, I immediately started to put that, um, very hype on the list of things that you, you, you might consider. So in the year, my first year as president, and then again um, in the centennial year of the Fed, I think I hit all six states in, uh, in, the, in the district. Um, so that, you know, that kind of regional uh, interaction was really what I put a lot of weight on in my, mm-hmm. in my time. Now, so you're going to accept an invitation. The invitation might come six months or nine months before you actually give the talk. Hmm. So you have no way of knowing what you're going to talk about at that time. Um, you just know that uh, something is going to likely be on the table that is worth right. communicating. Um, and then once you, when you get there to that point in time, you know, and, and generally it's like three weeks or four weeks before the actual uh, talk, you'll start to start to plan what's going to be in there. Um, I would say in general, you know, you're looking to give, you know, where the economy is, where it's going to be going, going forward, and what all that means for monetary policy. That would be a very standard talk. Sometimes you would give something a little more. If I talk at a university, I might give something a little more um, richer on the economics front and, you know, how Mm -hmm. economists think about things, that that kind of thing. Um, But the general talk to a a typical audience would be, um, you know, where is the economy now? Where do we expect it to go? And what does all that imply for policy? And when you wrote your speech, did you vet it with your lawyers and your staff economists before you went out to deliver it? You know, I had a team of folks that, um, that looked at it before I, uh, a combination of, of people mm-hmm. in external communications and also in, uh, in, uh, staff, among, uh, basic PhD economists. Um, I might reach out to a broader set of people in turn if uh like if I was talking on supervision and regulation i would I would turn to those folks for for support as okay. well but okay. no, there was no uh, standard need to um, um, talk to the legal team no i and and uh, I'm, uh, yeah that, that that was not part of the protocol okay so let's talk about the f o m c the big meeting that everyone pays attention to and 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 cares about the most probably as an outside observer. Um, how did you prepare for that? Did, did you have staffs come in with briefing material and, and give their views? And, and I'm also curious in, in that discussion, was there um, disagreements among the, the preparers and, and you had to make a stand, this is where we're going to go as, as a, as a, as a bank. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's a relatively large group of people who are involved in the, the briefing process, but uh, let me, let me start a little in terms of logistically. Sure. Um, Generally, um, we would start preparing, um, uh, I think the week before the meeting was a pretty intensive one for staff and for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and generally they would approach, be approaching, uh, um, the meeting, uh, separately for me to begin with. And then we would all come together on, uh, on Friday before the meeting, uh, to really try to put, you know, see where we, uh, where, 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 where things lay. And, um, yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of people had different views and you'd hear a lot of different perspectives from a lot of different folks at at different, different points in time. Mm -hmm. It was a very complex environment we're dealing with. And, uh, it's pretty natural that, uh, you have, uh, smart people in a room, you're going to get a lot of different perspectives. 
uh, at the end of the day, it's uh, it was my you know I I have to make the call about how what what yeah. we state the meeting and and uh, what perspect, per, perspectives get 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 offered in that in that setting. Um, but you know, hearing the different views, I think you know it's certainly incredibly helpful in terms of um, uh, forming my own what, what I'm going to be saying at the meeting, uh, obviously. Yeah, I'm, I've talked to David and Del Fado several times, and he's been on the, the podcast as well. And I know sometimes I've, I've reached out to him, and he's been real busy. Hey, Beckworth, I'll get back to you after the briefing, <laughs> you know. So it really, when it when it comes time, he's focused like a laser on it, and it consumes his every energy. So uh, you fly to D.C. Do you bring staff with you? Do they come into the room when you guys do the FOMC meeting? So we have uh, each Fed president uh, outside of New York. The non-New York presidents are each bringing mm-hmm. one um, um, staff person with them. Okay. And that's typically the research director, but not but not exclusively so. Yeah. Now, once on Twitter, we were talking about... Um, Richard Fisher from the Dallas Fed, I think you pointed out that he proposed something like a nominal GDP targeting rule, except he would focus on personal consumption expenditures, that, that C part of GDP. And, uh, and we were all shocked, like Richard Fisher, <laughs> you know, it's kind of flabbergasted. But then you pointed out that it was Evan Koenig, um, one of his staffers that kind of motivated him. And I've, I've read his papers on that. I, I really like them. Um, but you, you, Suggested on Twitter that shows the importance of a really good staff or the influence that a staffer can have on a president. So, can you speak to that? Are there you know at times where you know a staffer comes before a president and and really tr- turns on the light for them and, and and shows them an idea they want to push? Um, let me see. I mean, I you know I think I, it, it's almost like in my own case, there's just so many different places uh, mm-hmm. where where. Uh, you know, you're talking continually to people about policy, and I see. so it's sort of hard to identify that. Uh, I think that the, the example that I say with Richard is one of the more striking, simply because okay. uh, uh, I thought it was it was interesting to, to the uh, as you highlighted the extent to which uh, uh, nominal uh, PC targeting uh, might not <laughs> um, be uh, seen as something that Richard would be talking about in the meeting. Um, oh, but, absolutely, yeah. Uh, but but. Um, you know, it's a, uh, um, in my own case, you know, I'm talking, uh, I, I, I come to the meetings with a sort of different background than Richard. And so it's, I think, more natural for me to be talking uh, uh, yeah. on a more, more uh, continual basis to, to staff about how they, they're seeing, uh, mm-hmm. seeing issues. And it's just more, more of an ongoing influence in my own case than, than an aha moment yeah. that I could, could readily point Well, you're an academic. You know the literature well already. So Richard was a banker, am I correct? And he comes in, he may rely more on his staff. Richard uh, was a guy who came in uh, more as a market participant, I would say. That, that yeah. was his background. And uh, he also had, you know, he had, he had, had done a number of things. But, but I would say that the relevant experience that really was helpful, that he found helpful uh, when he talked about monetary policy was uh, – uh, his experience as a market participant, typically. Yeah. Okay. So now you're in the FOMC meeting. You got your one staffer there with you. Um, what is it like in the meeting? Can you, can you walk us through a typical FOMC meeting during your experience there? Yeah. Um, so you're in uh, a very impressive room. First of all, um, it's the board okay. room for the for the uh, Federal Reserve Board of Governors, and uh, um, it's an you're all sitting around an enormous table. Uh, that is the um, uh, at full strength the 19 uh, members of the committee. Although mm. uh, I, don't, I can't remember how many times we actually had 19, it wasn't that many. Um, and then there will also be staff at the table. Um, in particular, the, um, uh, the 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 head of the New York desk uh, market uh, markets group um, mm-hmm. is typically there to. To help uh, the committee with what's going on uh, in uh, in markets, and other staff staff will be uh, there to, to, to as part of the part of the uh, the meeting to, to present relevant materials to to the to the committee. So that's what you have in mind. Have in mind uh, an enormous table. Where you have 19 principals as well as um, some uh, some members of the uh, and some members of staff as well from both Washington and New York. I think one thing that to say about the meeting, which is really critical, is 
that um, the sort of the, the the baseline case for what the committee is going to be doing and how the committee is uh, going to be thinking about policy is really framed more by uh, input from staff in New York and Washington than from the non-New York banks. Um, I, I think, and this is actually something I only realized after I left the uh, left the committee. But I think the right way to be thinking about the committee is the non-New York banks are really like external members, and then the inside members of the committee are the members of the Board of Governors and the New York Fed. And actually, when you look at when we sat around the table, that was that uh, description is mirrored by how the the ordering uh, looks in terms of seats. So. Uh, really? the, the, chair, the vice chair, the, the vice chair of the committee, who is typically the, I mean, by, by uh, custom, the president of the New York Fed sits next to the chair of the uh, of the committee, and then uh, to that's to her right, and then to her left will be the vice chair of the board of governors, who is Stan Fisher, and then all the governors are, uh, I think, in order of seniority, next to uh, uh, vice chair Fisher, and. Only then do we start to, to get into the non-New York uh, presidents, and we'll, we'll circle around to uh, – the, the, we all have fixed places where we seat, uh, sit uh, from meeting to meeting. We don't get to move mm-hmm. around. Um, I was – Minneapolis is a little corner to itself, I would say. Um, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, on, on, um, to my left um, mm-hmm. is pre- was always President Evans, uh, uh, President of the Chicago Fed, and on my right, uh, President Bullard of the uh, St. Louis Fed. Um, but that's a, uh, yeah. So I think, I think in, beyond the seating, I think it is important to think about the meetings as really being, uh, the board of governors and the New York fed are, their staffs are really working together to formulate, to help the committee guide, uh, the, the, the formulation of what I would say the base case for, for, uh, okay. uh, policy. So, so what happens at a meeting? What happens is there was first a presentation um, at a typical meeting. Um, there are other elements that could be entering in about this, but staff will make a presentation about what's happened in markets over the past, um, uh, inter- over the intermeeting period. There'll be a presentation about the economy, how the economy sh- uh, will, is likely to evolve. And then uh, each um, uh, member of the FOMC will speak in turn about uh, how they see the economy. Um, so all, all the, uh, the, the 19 participants, if they're all there, will speak in turn about, and those presentations, uh, you know, depending on the person can, can last a, a fair amount of time. Um, the chair, um, then summarizes that, um, everything that, uh, it, she's heard and then, um, um, and, and then we'll offer her own, typically offer her own thoughts. So both chair uh, Chairman Bernanke and, and Chair Yellen uh, tended to, to lead from the, the from the back, so to speak. So that they, they they tended to come in at the end of the meeting, at the end of the round, okay. the first go round, to describe how how they saw things. Then the uh, um, there'll be a president. So that's all. That's the economy go round, and that's okay. Uh, you know, there's an attempt to keep that round pretty free of policy considerations. That's an, a, okay. an attempt to get a clean look at the economy and the outlook. Then um, we'll have a presentation from staff on uh, the policy options. Those will have been circulated well in advance of the meeting, typically. Mm-hmm. And there is, uh, um, if you go back over the transcripts, um, you'll see that option B uh, <laughs> Um, typically is the one that gets chosen as the chosen course for the committee. Um, and that's, that's the idea is that the uh, B is the, the, is likely to be the one that's going to be picked by the committee. And then alternatives A and C are, um, A is typically more dovish, so to speak, than what the committee will choose. And then C was, would be more hawkish. Huh. And, um, those are the staff, the staff will present a statement associated with those various, uh, alternatives. And, um, and, you know, uh, people on the, then uh, each, each participant will uh, speak in turn about their, their views on policy. And, uh, and again, the chair will, will, uh, wrap things up on that in the final, that policy go around, unlike in the economy go around, the vice chair of the committee usually, um, goes la uh, is a penultimate speaker. So that is the president okay. of New York fed will be the penultimate speaker in that go around. Um, 
Does that yeah. happen all on the first day, or is that over two days? That's o- that over our two day meeting. That will happen over two days. Yeah. Okay. So how do they get that min- that that the, the announcement out? I mean, they for what time? Say you know you're meeting on Tuesday, Wednesday, or well, just say on the on the second day. Do you stop at some point like mid morning? You give time for the secretary to run out, type up the message, then you guys has to come back to you and you have to approve it before it's released. No, the the statements will. Um, uh, and you, if you go back to the transcripts, you'll see this. So uh, just to be clear, I'm not, I don't. I, I have to be uh, <laughs> uh, adhering to what's already been released publicly on uh, on this stuff. But yeah, okay. the, the the but yeah, the, if you go back to the transcripts, you'll see that that what happens is that. The way you get 19 people to actually agree on a statement is you circulate that all those materials ahead of time. And so okay. for option A, there is a statement uh, in de- that's detailed that will have uh, you know the usual hundreds of words in it. Those for option B, um, there'll be a uh, another statement that'll be a, also have hundreds of words, and option C will be the same. And um, the committee is, by and large, choosing among those three potential statements. They're free to, you know, it's up to them. It's not staff that, that, that chooses this thing. It's up to the staff, committee mm-hmm. to, and you'll uh, certainly have heated attempts at wordsmithing. You know, if you go back to 2009 or 2010, you'll see lots of wordsmithing going on to, um, to try to uh, try to change the statement. And the reason for that is twofold. Um, one is to try to shape what the public and markets are going to be thinking about the, what the Fed is likely to do. But it's also important to realize that the statement plays the role of a contract among the people in the committee so that they have a complete an understanding of what they've all agreed to in terms of policy. And so it, that's another reason why wordsmithing ends up playing a big role in in mm-hmm. uh, in, in in the conversation. Okay, so you got Plan A, Plan B, Plan C. Now, something I've heard about the FOMC is that members have become more guarded in what they say in their presentations because they know five years later transcripts will be released. Do you think this is the case? I have no idea what it was like. Um you know, uh, I, I, I would, I, it was always, you know, it was always true when I was there, uh, that, uh, everyone was aware that transcripts were going to be, be released. I, um, I, I, I can speak for myself. That was not a material consideration for me at any time. Okay. What was a material consideration is there's people and, uh, you know, uh, Janet Yellen is famous for the level of care that she brought to the table in terms of her preparation. Mm-hmm. And, um, that's, that's a standard. And so you don't want to be seen as just winging it on, uh, <laughs> on these important issues. So yeah. I felt coming in that, boy, yeah, there's a real need to prepare ahead of time in terms of what I'm going to say and how I'm going to think about things. Uh, you try to be responsive and, uh, I, I, I certainly made effort, every effort to do that to, to what's being said in the meeting, but, Monetary policy is not something usually, you know, there are certainly exceptions in the time frame I'm talking about, but usually it doesn't matter if you, it's more something that can, it can be discussed over time. So if, if I say something in a meeting and Evan's uh, response to it in uh, the next meeting, well, that's, that, that frequency of interaction is good enough, so to speak. You know, it's not like we have to settle it right then in the meeting, uh, who's right on an issue. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's just that the pace, you know, that, that's the pace of monetary policy. You're really setting, a, setting an instrument that's going to have its impact in the economy 18 to 24 months down the road. Um, so we have a little bit of time usually to, to get things right. Um, so, yeah, I've been told the same thing. I have no feel for to what extent that's true or not, that, that, uh, uh, that keeping track of the transcripts has changed things. For me, as I say, it was... Having role models like Janet Yellen, you know, she was clearly um, very well. Res- as soon as I came into the committee, you, you saw that you know she's somebody that everyone listens to extremely carefully, and she's also somebody who comes in extremely well prepared. And so, okay, uh, you know what you have to do then. So, the, I guess the question I have then is, you know, you you want to avoid groupthink. You want to avoid looking controversial. Maybe, like you say, come in prepared, look professional. Um, but 
you don't want to do that to the extent that you know you're you're holding back what you really feel and what you want to say. And, and I know in your case, we would used to joke on Twitter and stuff that we could identify your dot plot because <laughs> you you tended to be and near the end of your your stay there. You were more the uh, the dove. We we could you know we we kind of missed you once you left because that that outlier dot plot was was missing. Um, so I get the sense you definitely voted your mind, but I, I guess the c- concern I would have is, you know, to what extent is there, you know, holding back and, and maybe not the fullest of the exchange of ideas and engagement. But what you said earlier is that there was a lot of give and take. I did not think that there was any uh, holding back that I sensed. I think, okay. but, you know, it's not, it's a, a a group that is trying to achieve good answers to tough questions. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you say the first thing off the top of your head <laughs> when you hear someone say something you disagree with. Um, mm-hmm. So if you go back to the transcripts for 2010, you'll see great examples of this where I, I, I made a case that there, that a lot of the unemployment that we saw in the U S was, was structural. And so very difficult to, to uh, treat using monetary policy. You will see, in the next meeting, not necessarily in that moment, you know, not, you know, not in that meeting, but at the next meeting, you'll see that um, other members of the committee and, uh, you know, uh, then President Yellen of the San Francisco Fed would be an example, but others as well, um, had gone back to their staffs, talked about what I said, and then come back with well-formulated uh, critiques of what I had said. And I think that's a great, you know, what would you want from a committee except that, uh, I, I think it, I think it ends up being it's definitely true that people said what they wanted and there was a lot of disagreement. But that doesn't mm-hmm. mean you have to be calling, in, uh, trying to call each other out on the fly. Um, uh, it it okay. can it, it's more it's actually more useful, more productive to have people go back and talk to their staff about about um, uh, to try to, to try to give as full and rich a, a response as possible. All right. Well, let me segue into this, and, and that's current Fed policy, but it also speaks to what happened there, and, and maybe you can speak to, to this question I'm going to ask, and, and that is, what if you did come into the meeting with a very different view than everyone else? So I know we've talked on Twitter about this, and you know my views. I, I think the Fed has been too tight uh, for most of the period since you know the, the crisis started. I think they were behind, uh, they fell asleep at the wheel in 2008. Um, I had Andy Levin on the show recently, and he thought the same thing. In fact, Andy Levin's very critical. He thinks the Fed needs, you know, they need more diversity on the on the board, more diversity at the Fed's. Just and he argues, man, the Fed had just talked to someone in the marketplace on the street, they would have known things were worse than they had perceived in 2008. And, and he thinks, you know, it's easy to get kind of lulled into groupthink there. So, if w- is it easy for someone who has a radical idea, someone who says, hey, let's overshoot the inflation target, let's well, let's allow inflation to drift over the target. Is 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 there space? in that discussion for someone like that? Um, you know, it's, it's definitely an institution where, um, uh, which is small C conservative. And what I mean by that is that it, it, it takes time for new ideas to, to, to have, to, to make their way to the, <laughs> to, to make their way from consideration to, to adoption in the fed. And, and that's, that's the truth of the matter. And, um, with that said, I, you know, I, I think that, um, you, you know, Charlie Evans start, started talking publicly about the, um, idea of thresholds in, um, 2011. Um, I want to say, uh, the second half of the year. And we ended up adopting thresholds uh, as a policy tool, um, at the end of 2012. um, you know, maybe we should, maybe, you know, maybe that conversation should have happened earlier during the recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I don't think that, that, um, you know, I, it was a challenging idea. It was a different idea, but it, it, it never nonetheless got done. Um, the, um, so I think the group think problem is really much broader than the FOMC, frankly. I, I don't think, okay. I think the Fed gets a lot of critique for this, but it's, it's really more that um, macroeconomics writ large really thinks about monetary policy as me- merely a, um, 
a crutch, uh, a support to the overall recovery pattern of the economy. And uh, it's only, you know, when I first came to the committee, I really had that perspective myself. Um, it's only later that I, I, I started to think much more about, boy, monetary policy is, is really pretty critical in, in shaping the speed of the recovery. And uh, I, I just think this is actually a more general belief that's held among academics, among market participants, that really the economy itself is, is self-correcting. And maybe monetary policy can, can speed that a little bit around the edges, but it's really just about mainly about the, the, uh, the recovery uh, that the economy, the, the, the self-correcting properties of the economy as a whole. This has nothing really to do with, I don't think this is something to do with the committee as, uh, itself. This is really the general view of academic macroeconomists and the general view of market participants, that that is how the economy works. And so if you go back to 2009, and you ask, you see, um, this is pretty much my first meeting, we were asked, how long do you think the recovery is going to take? And the baseline that staff had in their question was, do you think it's going to take longer than five or six years? Um, and about half the committee said, uh, it might take longer than five or six years. And this is under appropriate monetary policy. So people mm. had, and it's, it's simply the way um, that it's, the monetary policy is playing a supportive role, uh, a necessary mm -hmm. role, but it's not really uh, the driving force in, in shaping the recovery. Is this making and sense? Yeah. So it's it's the Fed. No, I agree with that. I and, uh, Fed policy in some sense is a reflection of the profession itself and what they what they view as you know, the way to go, the way to operate. Along those lines, I, I wanted to know. Did you feel as a Fed official and did you sense the FOMC felt pressure from Congress, from the body politic at large to keep inflation low that, uh, you know, even though maybe some overshoot may have been justified, at least theoretically, that there's just no way they could have done it. Now, again, maybe members of the certain members believe that was, a, was appropriate to have low inflation as well. We can talk about the, the SEP, the summary of economic projection uh, figures, but if there were people in the Fed who wanted to do some overshoot, a little more, a little more aggressive easing, you know, they they feel pressure from the public that they couldn't do it. No, I don't. I, I just so. First of all, you would definitely hear those voices. I mean, the, those voices were out there, and and um, but I I I I just don't think that was a key force. I okay. I think if you look at uh, Bernanke's speech at Jackson Hole in 2010, um, where uh, and this is a little more aggressive, maybe what you're describing. But if you remember earlier, early in 2010, Olivier Blanchard wrote a piece for uh, at the IMF uh, suggesting that maybe we need to have higher inflation targets. And um, most central bankers, I don't think it's because of political pressure. It's just simply, wow, that's way out there, <laughs> kind okay. of response. Because if you do that, if you raise the inflation target, then you've got uh, there's a lot of credibility issues that are on the table immediately if that that comes mm -hmm. to play. And and Ben Ben uh, ben, ben talked about that Jackson Hole in 2010 um, said that's just not on the table. We're not you know it's and I don't think it's because he was getting phone calls from Congress about it. It was simply he uh, I took it to mean that. Um, as a member of the committee, there wasn't support for the com in the committee for that kind of thing at all. Um, so th that's, but I, that's different from overshooting, yeah. to be clear. And yeah, yeah. And I, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I, no, I'm I'm sorry. I, I I'm thinking back to you know some examples of when he went before Congress, um, particularly 2000, early 2010, right after QE2 starts. Um, he goes before them and. I remember he gets grilled. He, you know, I believe Senator Corker, maybe a few others, were accusing him of, you know, the greatest debauchery of the currency ever, and and runaway inflation. When in fact, inflation, well, core PCE inflation at the time was about one percent. Um, <laughs> and there's just this. I, I get. I just again, maybe this is anecdotal, and, and I need to go look at polls and surveys to, to verify this. But I get this sense that people, the public, is paranoid about inflation taking off. You know, the almost religiously rigid view about where inflation should be, as opposed to kind of a more general notion of flexible inflation targeting. But I, I understand your point. There also are you know, theoretical concerns why you'd want to be careful going to that. Yeah, I, I what's what to say about that? I think that it's um, 
you, you want to separate out the, the views that people just came to the committee with, so to speak. And, and uh, uh, we mentioned President Fisher, um, President mm-hmm. Plosser was there. And I would put myself in that mix in 2009 and 2010 in these early days that, um, you know, you just, uh, I did not think, and um, uh, I think Plosser was in the same boat. He didn't see it that that unemployment was going to be a drag on inflation. The Fed had provided a tremendous amount of accommodation. We we thought there was a risk that inflation could get high. It wasn't because our congressperson was calling us about that. I mean, it was because we thought that was that was a real real consideration for that the economy should the the uh, the committee should take on board. Um, so I don't know. I I I never felt in the meeting that um, we had. The Congress was, or our political influences were, were that key in in. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's really more the overall intellectual influence of the of the academic profession is profession. critical, mm-hmm. and and then the people who are in the markets and seeing what's going on in markets also matter as well. And so those those two voice sets of voices really do matter tremendously in terms of how the committee is seeing what's going on in the the economy and how it thinks about things. Um, but it's not about, I, I really did not think I I've heard this argument from others that, you know, it's, it's, uh, the Fed was facing enormous political pressure not to do th- and not to, to be accommodative, uh, even more accommodative than they, 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 they were. I don't know. I, when I was there, I just did not get sense, the sense that that was a, a major, major issue. Um, well, let's segue then into, uh, the paper you just did for the Brookings paper on economic right. activities, which is, I think, a nice tie into this. And there you argue that the, you know, the board was effectively following a kind of Taylor rule. And um, from that perspective, it was the Fed's own <laughs> internal decision-making process that kept it from um, being more aggressive. So can you speak to that, to, to the argument you make in that paper? Yeah, so... Um I think when you get into the to the me- meeting is and there uh, you know a number of uh, obviously it was a very new situation for for everyone really mm-hmm. around the table the real question is how 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 should you choose what to do what you're going to be doing and I I think that the, the Fed was very influenced by the Taylor rule in, in trying to trying to trying to wrestle with that question and I I I I, I think it's be, largely, the Fed came to it, came to these uh, discussions from the point of view is what should our input, so to speak, what should our instrument be, um, mm. and what is the appropriate setting of our instruments, as opposed to um, are we getting back to two percent inflation, are we getting back to max employment sufficiently rapidly, um, and that set, former way of thinking about things, how should we set our instrument, is very organized by the Taylor Rule. Um, now in, in practice, what happened is that, um, I think the, the, the baseline outlook offered by staff, which is not a, it's not a policy prescription to be clear, but it's a baseline outlook offered by staff was grounded in, um, Taylor 93. That is the rule that John, uh, originally put forward, uh, Professor Taylor originally put forward in his classic 1993 paper. Um, the result of that was a very slow recovery. In fact, Inflation uh, in the staff's benchmark forecast never got back to target. It was it was one and a half percent five years later, um, and so. But I think I think that the, really the issue is that the Fed was not goal oriented in the way it thought about policy. It was really instrument oriented. Okay. And then the question is, how do you set those instruments? It's all it's driven by by the Taylor Rule or near variance of the Taylor Rule. So um, almost by almost by force of habit, everyone's thinking. The world they view the world through the Taylor rule, um, and it's hard to break from that 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 model. It's you, look. There's a model that you've used going into the crisis. It served you well, um, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a bunch of work to suggest that uh, the pre 2007 period that the Taylor rule was a good approximation to what you what you to uh, to, to appropriate or optimal monetary policy. Then you get into the post crisis period, and what are you going to turn to? Um, and I think the answer was that, that I, uh, the Fed, Fed ended up turning back to, the, to its pre-2007 reaction function as a major guide to what it was going to be doing with policy, despite the fact that it was going to lead to very slow recovery. Okay. Um, and see, this is where I, I'm, I still try to wrap my mind around this. So 
Janet Yellen had a speech, I think late last year, where she revealed the uh, a range of estimates for the real natural interest, short-term interest rate, not the, the long-term one that's revealed in the summary of economic projections, but kind of the, the real-time sh- short-run natural real interest rate. And then it's, it's like there's a median estimate, the range of estimates. And I really wish the, the, the board would release this on a regular basis. I think it would clear up communication and thinking a lot. But that's beside the point. I think it's interesting because the, the, uh, the data that she released showed that you know, at the bottom of the crisis in early 2009, that real natural rate was about minus 5%. I think she's mentioned this in speeches in other places yes. as well. So if you take that as given and you take, you know, take the Fisher equation and you're like, okay, we're stuck at a zero lower bound um, so, that, so the nominal rate stuck at zero. Um, the real rate you know, is at minus 5%. Well, the last term that's remaining is expected inflation. That, that, I mean, that the argument then is, well, the Fed should have, you know, engineered five, at least expected five percent inflation, and to, to you know, to to get to, for, to get its rate down in real terms down to the, the market clearing natural rate level. But that just simply was never going to happen. I mean, I, I had a hard, I still have a hard time imagining the Fed coming out and saying we're going to temporarily raise inflation expectations to 5% so we can get, you know, real rates down to the natural rate level. But that, that would be the argument theoretically. Um, so what prevented them? Is, is, is it this adherence, you, this argument you make that they stick into the Taylor rule or was it the goal, the lack of a goal orientated process? So I, um, you know, I, I obviously the zero lower bound matters. And so you, you want to be, you, you, and everyone was very uh, conscious of that. I think that uh, it's not as much the decision making, the challenge, I think, was not so much about where the Fed had its instruments set. It's really more about its plans and uh, for the removal of accommodation, for when it was going to start to raise rates and how fast it was going to raise rates. Mm-hmm. That is. In any model we write down, it, that's a critical determinant of current outcomes, is what is the, uh, the exit strategy for, for monetary policy. And that is where I, I would say the Fed uh, communicated that it was planning to exit very, uh, sooner than was appropriate and uh, communicated a faster, uh, faster exit as well than was appropriate. Um, and that, and, and it's there the way I would say that the Fed was largely uh, led by the by the Taylor Rule, um, misled by the Taylor Rule into to, to under providing accommodation. So I think the better way to be talking about this would have been to say that um, uh, I don't think you were going to get down to minus five percent, um, uh, be able to deliver that uh, a real rate of minus five percent. But I think you would have been able to to achieve a a, a more rapid recovery. If you had mm-hmm. communicated that that's what you were trying to achieve, and I would have taken actions, of course, that, that were commensurate with that. Okay. Um, and I think towards in the, I thought in September of 2012 and December of 2012, I thought we got to a much better place in terms of starting to communicate um, about uh, about exit, uh, saying that we were going to be uh, really uh, trying to provide backing to the recovery, um, being explicit about. Uh, quantitative markers for when we were going to raise rates. I thought all that was very valuable, and I wish we had done it earlier. I guess would be the the uh, uh, okay. the only comment on that. So uh, what you guys did with QE three should have done that way back uh, in the early period. Let me let me uh, put this out there. So you put that Brookings paper out. What we've been talking about, and some people objected to it. So John Taylor had a post where he he pushed back. He cited David Papel's work. So David Papel and some other authors, authors have argued the Fed hasn't been following the Taylor rule. Or, uh, George Selgin also pushed back, and they, they strongly disagree. They argue anything the Fed was more ad hoc. What would be your response to them? You know, I, it, it's it's true that the Fed was not required to follow the Taylor rule, mm-hmm. um, but they ended up following, <laughs> choosing in a discretionary way to follow something pretty darn close to the Taylor rule. I, okay. I think my, my response is... is and my theoretical piece uh, part adds on to this is that the theorem is not that any rule beats discretion. <laughs> the theorem is actually a very well chosen rule that requires a, a lot of information about the economy does beat discretion. And mm-hmm. I think that uh, my point is simply that using we are always going to be using past data to try to figure out what the best rule is. And 
that is going could has the potential of leading you very far astray. Um, so, I, I think the idea that it, it's it's a good idea to encode some kind of benchmark instrument rule into uh, into statute as is done in the Form Act. Um, boy, that's a huge mistake. Um, and it, it, I think it's, we're going to really regret it when uh, when it comes time to try to respond to it. If it was if if it's a passed into, into law, it hasn't been yet. But if it were to be passed into law. I think we would be very regretful of that because it would lead the Fed, I think, into making bad decisions, um, either potentially in response to high inflation threats. You could easily imagine the Fed would be forced not to respond aggressively enough to the threat of high inflation because it's forced to follow this rule, or it would not would underprovide accommodation in response to recessionary shock. Um, you know, it's it's uh, I think discretion. The much better way for Congress to be approaching the Fed is simply to be insisting on much more timely delivery of specific objectives. Um, I, I'll put it I'll put it this way, David. When I, you know, I, I, you mentioned earlier that I was a CEO. What, one thing you learn pretty quickly is trying to tell people exactly how to do their job is not a recipe for success. But laying out a clear set of objectives and expectations for them that they're supposed to achieve when they have that job. That is a recipe for success, and that's what Congress should be doing with the Fed: is laying out what they expect from uh, from the from the FOMC, and insisting on delivering on the, on those outcomes, as opposed to trying mm-hmm. to tell them what to do. As as uh, the Taylor Rule is all about, tell, trying to tell the Fed what to do. Yeah, I you know I talked to Andy Levin as I mentioned before, and, and he has an idea a proposal where. Every year, the Fed would make an annual report where they lay out its, its objective for the year and then have a quarterly report that, where the Fed assesses what it's done you know, since the last, last report or since the beginning of the year. Um, and I think that would be immensely useful because I think one of the challenges is that when, when Congress and, and Janet Yellen, the Fed chair, come together, they speak right past each other. Um, and if there was some kind of at least you know, framework, uh, benchmark, you know, they could – Say this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. This is why we deviated from it. And I know the Form Act to some extent does that. And um, you know, my understanding of the Form Act is that it's there is a Taylor rule, but the Fed could deviate from that. But your concern is that it would effectively, even though they could deviate and explain why, your concern is that they would end up uh, following it anyways. Uh, but I, I guess my 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 point of this is that. It would be nice if there was some way for Congress and the Fed to kind of speak to each other as opposed to past each other. Yeah, but that's, uh, that's easy to achieve. If you look at the Bank of Canada's website, the Fed should be mm-hmm. mimicking that and the, and the Congress should be mimicking that. Bank of Canada's website says, you know, uh, um, here's, here's where inflation is today. Our target, our, 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 they only have one mandate. They have uh, have inflation mm-hmm. as their uh, 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 get two percent inflation is their their goal. They tell you where inflation is today, how long they expect it to get back, and uh, when uh, uh, the governor of the bank, Governor Polos, talks to, to Parliament, it's going to be about that. And um, that's the problem is that Congress is not. There's no common understanding between Congress and the Fed about what the Fed is trying to achieve. And without that common understanding between the overseer and the overseen about what the goals mm-hmm. of the institution are, uh, none of this none of this is going to be be uh, be fruitful. Uh, the Fed wants to, I, I, you know, I know as a member of the FOMC, people want to be able to choose their own goals. That, that, that's viewed as being appropriate uh, indep- level of independence. I don't agree with that at all. I think that the Fed should be ch- have the independence to choose its instruments. Okay. As best to achieve its goals, but Congress should be setting its goals as a representative of the American people. And Congress had shown no interest in this at all. And so you end up with these odd discussions between uh, when, when uh, Chair Young goes to testify about all sorts of potential goals for monetary policy. Congress has to be clear about what it expects, and then the Fed will, I think, then – then deliver on that. I, I think right at the Form Act uh, makes it clear that Congress expects the Fed to follow the Taylor Rule, um, and that's a recipe I think that could lead us to, to very bad outcomes. Well, what would you have the Congress do uh, designate as the goals for the Fed? So I think that well, that's a great question. First of all, um, mm. you know I I, I would uh, I would definitely want to have a, a very serious conversation before we went there, but I. 
I'm very inclined to some kind of level targeting. Um, uh, price level targeting, I think nominal GDP targeting should be, uh, should be part of the mix. Um, I think that inflation targeting, you know, I, I, I've grown more and more uh, as the Fed misses. <laughs> have I'm grown with longer you. I'm and longer. with you. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot yep. of consideration should be given to level targeting. But boy, yep. shouldn't, wouldn't it be cool to have Congress have this conversation? I think it'd be fantastic uh, to have have a, a actual explicit conversation about should we be doing level targeting, nominal GDP targeting, uh, informed mm-hmm. by, of course, input from the experts of the Federal Reserve, but also experts from around the country in, in different yep. academic settings. That's the right conversation for Congress to be having, as opposed to many of the side issues that we we end up hearing about it at, when Yellen testifies. Well, I'm very sympathetic to your goals, as you know. I. I, you know, in theory, we should be doing flexible inflation targeting, but it seems to me in Europe and the U.S., um, it's more like good old-fashioned, rigid, straight-up inflation targeting in practice. And level targeting, I think, would make the central bank more accountable because, you know, a level target requires you to make up for past misses. Um, let me – we have a few minutes left. Nariana, I, I got to ask you one last question, and that's it's kind of been uh, making the rounds – and, and I'll motivate it by talking about Jenna Yellen's speech that she had at Boston Fed Conference. And in this speech, there's several things she brought up. But one that she brought up I thought was interesting, and Larry Summers is effectively making the same point, but she, uh, she questioned kind of the, the general view in macroeconomics that, you know, in the long run, supply side is all determined by fundamentals. Um, you know, monetary policy, aggregate demand can have you know, short run effects, like you said, on the margin. But she she kind of pushed back and said maybe an area for research is to reconsider how much effect can demand have on the supply side. So in a period like we've been in or the Great Depression. So do you share that view that uh, you know, potential real GDP to the supply side can at least in part be endogenous to the level of aggregate demand growth? Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's – I would, I would go certainly go as far as, as I, I read uh, Chair Yellen going in her speech, which is to say this is a, a theory that should be uh, explored further. And, mm-hmm. um, um, we're, you know, economists are very quick to divide uh, forces in the economy into exogenous and endogenous. And I think too often we treat uh, the rate of innovation and the rate of investment um, as being outside the purview of monetary policy. But uh, any model you write down of, of total factor productivity of, of, of uh, innovation in the economy, immediately monetary policy will show up as being an important influence on that because the real rate of interest, which is what monetary policy tries to try to affect, is a key input into those decisions. So I, I was very sympathetic to that perspective. Um, I think that if we had uh, better demand expectations for firms, uh, you would see – more implementation and more innovation, and you'd see faster productivity growth as a result, and that would give the Fed more room to be uh, stimulated to the economy. So that would be a positive. So I, I was quite, I was quite sympathetic to her view. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think it's not a theory that uh, it's a theory worth exploring much uh, with a lot more care than has been given over the last thirty years in in, in macro. I would say. Yeah, very interesting. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Nariana Kochilokota. Nariana, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for the great questions, David. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.